Uh, let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today for a very, very important topic. My name is Brian Alexander. Uh, I'm the host creator, chief cat herder, organizer, and founder. And I'm here to guide you through a conversation about a particular type of teaching with technology for this fall called the HyFlex. Now what I'd like to do is welcome our guest. I'm delighted to introduce Brian Beatty not just because he's another Brian, but also because he is known as the founder of the HyFlex method of teaching, a way that combines face-to-face -face and online conversation. Um, this is a topic of incredible importance for the fall, and I'm really, really glad you could make it. Greetings, Professor Beatty. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you hear me? We can hear you just perfectly. Good Great. Uh, I love your background, which has uh, stairs going up and down, which somehow mm. kind of symbolizes two different courses that can be combined in HyFlex. But before, I, before we dive into that, let, let me just ask you, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the major topics and what are the major projects uppermost for you? Well, I have to say, uh, for the next few months, uh, it's really focused on supporting faculty and institutions who are working on implementing these, especially in light of the kind of the uh, kind of the unique characteristics that we'll have in the fall and probably into the spring and maybe even beyond there for high flex or for hybrid courses in particular and where hybrid flexible can kind of fit into that. I've also just um, I'm re returning back to a full time teaching uh, work after being oh, wow. eight years of it as an administrator. So I'm actually preparing my own courses uh, again. <laughs> Uh, all online in fall and hopefully back in the classroom in a high flex mode uh, after that. So that's going to take a lot of my work. And the other aspect of this is, I mean, just in the, in the world of high flex work as well, it's really a shift. And we're seeing a shift now clearly from uh, one where it was uh, relatively low uptake uh, in many schools and more, more faculty driven in many cases towards more of a institutional focus for many places. And so that's going to change the nature of what's being done, the practices we develop and we share, uh, as well as the research that's going to be done immediately, but also the longer term impact of that uh, kind of will have a lot, a lot better, bigger base to draw from and many more colleagues to be participating with. Many more colleagues, indeed. Um, let me, friends, I'm just going to ask a couple of quick questions for our guest, um, but I would love to hear from you for your questions and comments. And already we're seeing a few of them come in. So again, if you'd like to join us up here on stage and ask, um, uh, Professor Beatty questions, just click the raised hand button. Uh, if instead you'd like to just type in a question or comment, just go to the question mark button and type that in. Uh, Professor Beatty, and I have to say, it's pretty eerie to have two men named Brian with beards on at the same time. Um, <laughs> but one question to ask is, when, when I try and define high flex for people, I, I usually I point them to your book, or I say it's a combination of face-to-face -face and online learning at the same time. How am I doing for definition? You're the inventor of this concept. Can you, can you give us a better sense of it? Yeah, first of all, I'd say that uh, when I started uh, thinking about this uh, 15 years ago, I had to ask myself that question about, you know, you know, isn't this being done already? Don't we already have some models that work where we have online or distance students in the same kinds of classes at the same time with face to face? And there, there are certainly examples of that. I, I um, uh, came across my, some of myself in my dissertation research, but there was no, nowhere where I saw really this emphasis on flexibility for students and giving students this um, kind of uh, immediate control over how they're going to participate, whether online or not, or or in the classroom. Most of the situations I was aware of, you know, they were remote for a reason. They were they were distant remote, or they could never come to class. Uh, and so, so that's why we came up with a term called high flex hybrid flexible course design, because I thought I can't just call it a hybrid course model because a hybrid can mean a lot of different things. You know, there are, there are very many different models. And so I thought I, want, I wanted to focus on that. And so that's kind of where it came from. And so I was building on my experiences as a grad student, as a teacher from other places using mixed methods, using blended approaches and kind of trying to come up with a design aspect so that when we were thinking about creating this intentionally, uh, we had, you know, kind of a map to follow, and so that's what we 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 developed. Uh, myself and my colleagues at San Francisco State, and many others have done over the years, and, and actually made some, you know, make their own unique modifications to it as well. Um, so I know I only answered half the question, or just started on my own. What, can you get me back on track with that? Well, sure, sure. Um, I, I guess I can do it with an example, and tell me if I was doing this uh, the right way. 
Um, I teach uh, part-time at Georgetown in its uh, graduate program on learning design and technology. And sometimes in our classes, uh, we meet face-to-face, -face. I mean, not right now, but in the past year or two, we've, we've met face-to-face. -face. But some of our students have been remote, uh, and so we've wheeled in uh, big screens or used projectors so they'd be represented. And as the instructor, um, I would uh, take great care to make sure they were included in the conversation, that our audio was mic'd up so that they could see and hear everything very well. Uh, and I made sure to privilege them, you know, to ask them questions. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes I was remote uh, as well. Uh, and so mm -hmm. it's a bunch of different gear, including uh, owl mics and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that an example of HyFlex? Yeah, so uh, thank you uh, for kind of for uh, helping me kind of come back onto the question. Uh, so when I define it, essentially I tell them it has to, the way we've defined it and the way we have it in our, essentially in our policy, academic center policy, is that HyFlex course has a face-to-face -face, uh, path through it and an online path through it, and students have the freedom to choose which path they're following. Uh, you know, on a week to week or a session by session basis, right? And so we don't we don't dictate which is if that's a synchronous online path or an asynchronous online path. Some of us teach with both paths available. Uh, many faculty choose one or the other or use one for some things and use some, a different one for for other kinds of things. And so there's are kind of kind of, you know, taking some of the control necessarily away or maybe just changing the options better based on the, the needs of the situation. And so that's what we've kind of come down to. We used to say more things about, you know, our policy used to have another couple of sentences. It was, you know, a nice policy written by academics. So it had a lot of words. And when we revised it more recently, we just we just stripped it down to one sentence. There's an online path. There's a face to face path and students get a chance to choose. Wow. That's that it. Be clear. It's got to be clear or it gets really confused. Now, when I'm talking with institutions now who are thinking about this, especially in light of the fall, I, I, that's one of the things I tell them. Is you have to be really clear about what, yeah. what, your, what your guidelines are. If your faculty are doing all the course design and building their own courses, they kind of need to know kind of where the guardrails are. If we're going to call it this, here's what, here's what we can do and here's what we're not going to uh, we're going to try not to support. Many of them end up with the same kind of um, uh, faculty choice as far as the options, as far as the online piece. And some of them are saying, well, our online version is going to look like this. We're going to have synchronous or we're going to make sure we design for asynchronous. And then if you want to bring in synchronous, you know, that's more maybe more left up to uh, to a faculty. You include uh, faculty and support staff also having that right to choose. Uh, support staff. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, so everything from uh, librarians who right. participate to instructional technologists to uh, media support. Well, I think I think when you're making the decision about what kind of modes to support online, uh, yeah. I think it's pr what I find is that it's primarily a either a program decision. This is the way we're going to sell this to students or market it to students, and maybe that's one of the reasons they're doing high flex. And so it's going to look like this. And, and in those cases, it maybe has a more firm structure on what that looks like. But in other cases, it's, it, it seems to be the faculty. And then, uh, of course, you have to have the support staff and, and the infrastructure to support either mode. I think most of our campuses, most of our institutions probably are very well equipped to support an asynchronous online learning mode. The synchronous online learning mode, um, especially uh, before this spring may have been a little a little more sketchy on some campuses yeah. uh, and now we've all kind of been most of us at least have been forced into this immediately flipping on an online synchronous mode and so we're seeing what what our infrastructure can support well and maybe what it doesn't support so well and now the complexity will be well if I bring this into the classroom you know will my classroom environment support that given the the changes in a whole class potentially well a small but whole class most likely uh, in in the room, as opposed to just me speaking, you know, through my laptop here at my dining room table. Well, uh, speaking of uh, of laptops, uh, and thank you uh, for that excellent answer. Um, I'm just I'm just delighted that we can take away the most precise definition of all time. That's really 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 tight. Um, we have a question that builds on this from Elizabeth Shala uh, at Boston College. Let me just bring uh, Dean Shala's uh, comment up on stage, here on the screen, so you can all see it. Uh, and she asks, what difference is there among HyFlex, adaptable remote instruction, and adaptable blended instruction? Well, that is a very good question. And uh, I don't know what the definition would be for adaptable remote instruction or adaptable blended instruction might be. Um, and so I can't really tell you what the differences are. Uh, I will I will admit the fact that uh, we're using some terms now when we're discussing this with institutions around like a hybrid HyFlex mix. 
where you're not going to be hybrid, all, high flex all the time. There may be some things where you cannot do online. So you're going to bring students onto campus or some other remote location, perhaps. And so it'd be a kind of a traditional, more hybrid where the instru instructor is dictating the per performance location or the participation location. And then at other times when it makes sense, it would be high flex. So it's sort of a, a modified hybrid or a, high, or a high, modified high flex or a hybrid high flex, which gets really confusing. Okay. So uh, I don't know what the other terms are, which is one of the challenges with our terminology, right? And why I try to keep a very simple definition of what high flex is to me. When I use a term, when I, you know, when I write about it, that's typically what I'm talking about. In my own teaching, I teach a different kind of course. I teach a professional development courses as well. Mm -hmm. In those, I used to teach high flex uh, with a face-to-face -face component. But after doing that for about a year, we kind of decided in, in the program, there doesn't seem to be a good reason to have a face-to-face -face component for this uh, because of the nature of the, the audience we were serving. And so we created we just basically did it online, but the, and the flexibility we have is between a synchronous participation or asynchronous participation, which right. I think many others teach. And so I don't really call that high flex. Um, uh, it's kind of like a modified online high flex, but uh, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to add a couple of terms just just to make it fit that road. But it, it is the, the principle of, a, of providing flexibility for students so they can better meet, you know, their scheduling needs, uh, what works for them, their technology needs, perhaps. Sure. I think is what really we're trying to follow. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I think that's that's a, a very honest answer. And uh, uh, Dean Schlala, uh, if you'd like to follow up with uh, more comments on that, we'd be glad to hear from you. Um, friends, that's how uh, text questions work. Um, and let me just show uh, another one right now. This is from our friend uh, Maha Bali at uh, the American University in Cairo. And Maha asks, does HyFlex work better with two instructors or large numbers of TAs? I assume the model means the online option can be any alternative to face-to-face, -face, not necessarily live streaming in-person lectures. Oh, that's that's a that's a really good question. Uh, so when when we talk about starting to teach this way, there are two things that the faculty really has to uh, uh, figure out early on, and, and that has to do with how you're going to do this. And a lot of times, that's around you know, the workload question, but also the workflow question. And so there, so one aspect is how do you build the online course, uh, uh, you know, so that you have an online option. Uh, so that's one aspect of this. But the other aspect, which is really what I think you're asking for, is how do you engage students over the course of the class, the term, et cetera, so that they're, they're being facilitated and they're having interaction with the faculty member, with the other, with the other students, perhaps um, whoever, Whoever is, you know, fulfilling that role in larger classes, uh, like many of us have right now, there may be TA support who can help with facilitating student engagement over the course, like for a week by week or between sessions. So that's certainly a possibility. Not everybody who teaches a large online course or a large course in general has TA support, uh, and so there may be other strategies like using group discussion, you know, group group based discussions, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to everybody in the same discussion, those kinds of things, or coming up with other ways of supporting interaction uh, that maybe don't rely so much on, uh, you know, don't rely clearly on the one to one between faculty and students for the baseline interaction. When I teach smaller classes, it's not so much of a problem uh, because I can give one to one interaction and still manage workflow, the time, the time I'm spending on it uh, and the and the and the timing of the time, really the synchronicity there. Uh, mm -hmm. Much easier than if it was a very large class. So do, do mm -hmm. two instructors teach it? I think if you use two instructors for a large lecture class on, on campus, you know, that would be a natural, you, you know, you would probably still use two instructors here. I don't think you need to have two instructors, although you do need skill sets in online uh, in engagement and interaction, no matter, you know, depending upon what methods you're using. Yeah. You've got to have some skills to do that. Uh, just like you need skills in the classroom to effectively engage students, especially students in a large class, uh, effectively. So there are different skill sets, and if, if if and that's one of the biggest challenges of faculty who who've taught in the classroom for many many years and have never taught online, is trying to understand well what are those skill sets and how to take their excellence in the classroom and kind of transition that to excellence online as well. Wow. Very, very well. That's a great detailed answer. Uh, uh, and Maha, thank you uh, again for, uh, for that really great question. Uh, now I'd like to uh, bring in someone on video. Uh, I'd like to bring in the, uh, our, our longtime friend and supporter from uh, Houston, Texas, uh, Tom Hames. Uh, Tom, I think we need to make sure your camera is on. I think it just went off. All right, Tom, we'll bring you back. Um, let me know when your camera gets back on. Uh, we have more questions that are just coming in all over the place. Um, and uh, one is uh, from uh, Randy Brooks at Texas A&M. Uh, and Randy asks, in the high flex room involving teams, 
is it best to mix the team such one member is live and the rest are connected from a remote location? Social distancing suggests limiting in-class interface. You know, Randy, that's a great question. And mm -hmm. this is the first time we've really kind of had to address this idea of limiting the face-to-face, -face, especially the close face-to-face -face interaction in a classroom. Um, what I would normally say, and, and I, I still say this, is that I try to, if I have online synchronous students and in-class students, and I'm doing some sort of a student discussion breakout, assuming I can manage the classroom well, like, uh, you know, kind of isolate the noise areas and things like that, I try to have the online students sharing in one of the, the groups in the class with the in-class students. As long as students have devices that they can use to in, to interact in the online environment, or maybe we have some, some uh, tablets that are available uh, that they could use, then we can we can do that. Uh, I've never had a class where I haven't had any students who all, who aren't you know who who cannot um, participate in a synchronous live session to essentially help me in the classroom as well as being there to kind of connect the remote students live. That can work really well. Now, if you don't have a setup that that provides that, where the technology in the classroom or maybe the audio qualities of the classroom wouldn't mm -hmm. support that, I also have had. Uh, online synchronous students essentially form their own group and, th and then the classroom students form their own groups uh, and then what we try what I try to do then is make sure we have a consistent uh, uh, reporting out capability like we might all report out to a discussion forum or some other online site where everybody's uh, report out is treated equally and then give them you know basically the attention time in the classroom to, to talk about that but I do try to mix them up as much as I can you know because clearly we're trying to support no matter what we're doing online and face to face we're trying to support an integrated learning community and if I've got synchronous students online and in the classroom, then I try to find as many ways as I can to integrate them. So it is one class as opposed to two separate classes that just have to be sharing the same LMS shell. Uh, thank you. Uh, th that's an, another really, really detailed uh, answer. This has become uh, a high flex seminar uh, at this point um, because of the high quality um, of all this information. Uh, let's see, uh, we have more people who are uh, bringing in um, uh, request. Let me see if we can bring Saihua Xia. Did I miss? Did I mangle your name completely? I'm sorry. I didn't ask a question. Oh, okay. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, we have uh, Renee Liederman uh, Girard at uh, MCPHS University. Uh, but we need your video on Renee Arena. Darn it. That's okay. Just let me know when you can get back on. Um, we have a stack of questions, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, this is one from Tristan Johnson, who asks a real clarifying question. What is the biggest student challenge with HyFlex, and what is the biggest faculty challenge? Uh, uh, good questions. I think the biggest student challenge is, um, is similar to a student student who's going to take an online course for the first time. It's figuring out how they how they learn effectively in the online environment. Uh, and, and oftentimes that comes down to uh, time management. Of course, it's pretty clear most of us uh, have gone through that ourselves as we've learned to learn and work online. But our students in particular, I think, are susceptible to uh, poor performance starting out, especially if they're not able to manage their time well or you know haven't, have never even had to do that because we're taking away that structure of, okay, you show up to class at 8.15 and you're done at 9.20, and then you come back two or three days later. Okay, that structure is, in many ways, unless it's asynchronous online, is, is kind of gone for students. But then there's also all this work to do after the class, and that may be the same for your face-to-face -face students as well. So time management would be one thing. And then the second part is just using the technologies, uh, you know, having access to the appropriate technologies, you know, the connection technologies, uh, on a on a regular basis and, and, a, and a basis that fits their convenience or where they think that's convenient in their schedules to use them. So if I don't have ac good access to like um, you know the bandwidth at home or a, or a computer or a device at home, and if I have to go somewhere else to use that, coffee shop, whatever library if, when they're open, um, that makes it less convenient and that can work for me. I, I can work as an online student like that, uh, and yet it, it's one of the challenges that students have to overcome. Um, I guess a third part would be the whole idea of engaging online. One of the challenges with any kind of online instruction, especially with students doing it for the first time, and especially when they're in a class that they may not be so engaged with in general, right? It's a, it's a requirement I have to meet. It's not maybe in my major. Maybe it's a large class too, and I don't know this instructor. They're from a completely different part of campus, and maybe I don't know the other students. So that, those are all kind of things, that, the hurdles that they kind of have to get over to get the, the internal motivation to engage in that class. And so intentionally designing 
you know, kind of community building exercises that students, you know, kind of get them more interested in being part of this group can certainly be a good good approach in those situations. But yeah, time management, the, the environment and technology, and then the whole idea of wanting to be engaged in the class as online students. Now, if they're choosing to be in class, uh, you know, pretty much those are, those those problems are are much less, you know, uh, and may not even be in existence. So it's really what I have to focus on is the shift from the face to face to the online. Most most faculty who are starting to do Hyflex are shifting that way, as well as most students. So it's part of a larger current then. Um, well, thank you. Again, uh, an excellent question. Uh, Tom, uh, we're still not getting your camera. Um, let me um, bring, there's two closely related questions. Uh, Brian, can you still hear us? Brent, I think you just blinked out. Are you still there? Yep. There you go. You just went black just for a second. Okay. Now, we have two questions about students, and they're very closely related. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring them up one after the other. One is from uh, R. Bruno at my alma mater, the University of Michigan, um, and uh, they ask, could this model allow for the same type of choice for instructors at schools where the campus is reopening this fall? Or is HyFlex centered on the instructor's presence in the face-to-face -face classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we've had to address that a couple of times uh, this spring as we're preparing uh, different places, uh, because that's a real, you know, that's a real, real thing. This fall is there may be opportunity or times when a faculty member is not able or or, or maybe has a choice not to be in the classroom. Um, uh, and so, can you still do this kind of thing? And my answer is usually, well, your if your students are still able to be in the classroom. Uh, then there's still a form of high flex as long as you can do the remote teaching effectively like to that remote location you know we in the in the field we have expertise developed over decades of of work in the distance education world you know pr you know before online especially video teleconferencing things like that so there are certainly ways to teach effectively that way um, but the question then would be on a campus decision well what does that mean if the faculty's not in the classroom can the students still be in the classroom is there have to be another faculty member there who's like just kind of managing you know the safety security privacy other kinds of restrictions in the class or is it more likely that there just wouldn't be a face-to-face -face, uh, session planned if the faculty is not able to teach there now if the faculty is not able to be there on a regular basis i mean you, you then you you know you'd make that decision now probably um, but if it, let's say a faculty has to be out for two weeks you know you know they're exposed in some way and they have to be out for 14 days uh, at least uh then what what would you do um uh and i i think you know on my campus i believe you know we have to have someone who's officially representing the university in a classroom, you know, when students are there uh, for, for uh, you know, risk management concerns, if nothing else, uh, but then also to manage it. Could a TA do that? Uh, you know, if someone who's uh, being paid by the university, a graduate assistant or something like that could probably fill that role, uh, as well as someone who can help facilitate, similar to the way I would try to use an in-class student as helping to facilitate the synchronous online component if I'm doing, you know, kind of both sets live, you know, that, that person could fill that role. Uh, in the classroom is kind of like essentially just trying to facilitate that remote location, remote from the instructor while the instructor's, you know, remotely kind of uh, kind of conducting the overall class. Well, thank you. Um, uh, good, good question. Um, mm -hmm. And we have two other questions that actually follow up with uh, the student side. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is from uh, our friend uh, Sarah San Gregorio. Uh, who asks, many of the local higher education institutions are talking about a version of HyFlex. There doesn't seem to be student mm -hmm. choice, instructor choice. Was well, student choice the primary goal of HyFlex? That's a great question. Uh, and that's, uh, I, 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 try to, I try to include that whenever I'm telling the HyFlex story, because our initial goal uh, from our department was essentially to allow our, our online students to complete our program uh, and to be in our courses to support enrollment in engagement, well, graduate program, declining enrollments, uh, mid mid you know 2005 timeframe, uh, pretty common. And so it was what we were trying to do. Is and it, for me, it was an alternative to trying to flip a program that's been face to face for 25 years into a fully online program by the start of the next term. So that wasn't going to work for us. And so I I I, uh, I got department chair permission and some a little bit of support to create a model that would allow online students to be part of our face to face classes. Right. But the idea was not necessarily to give students uh, the choice of flipping back and forth. That came as a, a relatively quick realization afterwards, after we 
found that we could do this, we could do this well, uh, and it would support fully online students in our classes. There are other things we found to be valuable as well. And the first one was to provide that, that, that flexibility to students um, uh, in our region, since we, we're, we're serving a regional market, um, mm -hmm. so they could be there or not based on their, their, their practices in the class. I mean, you know, like, like their life at things, the, the work things going on, the family issues or travel or other kinds of things, they could still participate. Um, we also found that uh, then we were able to attract other students regionally or locally who couldn't be part of a face-to-face -face program because, you know, because of the time, time, the timing of the classes and their location and commuting and everything that now could be part of online students. Since they weren't remote students, they weren't like from a traditional distant kind of online market, they were from our local market. Uh, but they were kind of they were frozen out earlier because they couldn't be there in class. And so so for them, they had that. And then uh, they also then could take advantage of the flexibility. I had students tell us over time, even if they were always online, they really appreciated the fact that they could be there on campus and be part of an in-person discussion, you know, uh, in the class if they wanted to be. Uh, or I also had students who were in the class all the time. But they also told us we really appreciate. I really appreciate the flexibility of being able to be online. If I couldn't be here in person, I prefer the in person. Right. I'd always choose that. But I, I was ha very happy to have a backup. That that ties into uh, directly to another question from uh, Rebecca Frazzi, uh, who has been on the program before, who runs the awesome Flex Space, uh, and she asks about choice and commitment. Uh, do students have to commit at some point to attend virtually or on campus? Or can they just decide not to show up on campus for a given class? It seems hard to plan with no RSVP. Right. Okay. So re connecting this back to the other question, keep, if you keep this up on the screen, I'll get to it directly. Thank you for the question, yep. Rebecca. Uh, love flex space, by the way. Um, there. So in the fall, there will be a lot of situations where students won't be given that that choice. Right. We, we won't, as an institution or as a, as a teaching faculty member, be able to accept maybe new students into our rooms on a week to week or a session by session basis. There may be some restrictions around who can be in the classroom. Uh, you know, maybe there's gonna be a, a group of students who are allowed to be in the class and no new ones will be allowed to join it, you know, for, um, you know, essentially for, uh, for uh, social distancing or physical distancing kind of, kind of concerns. And so I think a lot of flexibility will be different in the fall than we would normally expect. And so that's obviously gonna have an impact. Now, as far as the, the, the question from Rebecca is also a relevant question in normal times, because you know there is a real, there's a real chance that there'll be an extreme imbalance in the way the students are participating in the section. And until you figure out that what that is for this kind of students in this kind of course, you know, maybe this period of time, uh, that's a little challenging to plan for. If you've got smaller classes, and every, especially the problem is really then is everybody shows up online and I have three students in class, you know, that's a very different kind of course experience than my normal, you know, 20 to 25 people in a seminar. Yes. Right? And so I have to be able to think ahead of, the, of that. Uh, and in some cases, in, in many cases, in fact, uh, faculty will, will ask their students what their intentions are without telling them, you know, we have to do it online or we have to do it face to face. Uh, they'll ask them what their intentions are. And if they get a sense that uh, most of the students will be online or most of the students will be in class and they can plan differentially. Now, if you have most of your students in class, which was my experience for the most part, and, and relatively few online, especially relatively few in the asynchronous environment, you know, a traditional design of an asynchronous online course will include discussion forums, and those become very weak discussion opportunities. It's a very, very, very different kind of discussion when you've got three people who yeah. have a discussion requirement. And so I've shifted my approach to essentially move all my students into the online discussion forum, even if they're in class, because I wanted that to be a rich environment. So we'll use that in class as a tool to help us in our, in, you know, kind of capture some of our discussions as well as continuing it throughout of the class. And so I've been able to adapt to that. So it doesn't bother me as much when they're online or face to face, uh, as far as at least worrying about the kind of the potentially weak, weakness of an online interaction. I expect that there'll be a lot more uh, of students, if there is choice at all, that they may have to reserve a seat, you know, for an upcoming session. Yeah. So that if, if, you, if you all you are limited to is the number of seats, not necessarily who's in them. Uh, I would expect that there'll be a lot of places, like I said earlier, well, you, you, maybe these 15 students are allowed to be in class. Everybody else in the section is, is kind of an online student and is not really allowed in class. Uh, and, but still, you're going to need you're going to have some flexibility because students who are even assigned a seat in class will have to have the freedom to be online uh, if, if they're forced to or perhaps even if they you know kind of want to if, if it's available to them, if the design supports it. So, yeah, less flexibility, which is why. 
you know, I, I tell you know, people will ask me, well, can I call this high flex if we're, if we're not fully flexible? I say, well, given the situation, I'd say, yeah, you give them as much flexibility as you can manage. Um, and if you're doing the, kind of the dual pass with the connections, I say, let's let's design it for high flex, even if they don't have as much flexibility as we might you know, initially have intended. We do have a, a note about that. Uh, just to add, I want to make sure we share this. Not a question, but a comment from uh, Craig Hood at Loyola. He says, for the fall, we can't really give students choice to attend face-to-face when we can only have 25 to 30 percent occupancy for our rooms. Yeah, I, I can respond to that too. We've had large online courses or large classes, especially large lecture capture or lecture lecture classes, which are we usually use lecture capture for, sure. where we we end up with about fifteen percent of the students coming into the cl- the lecture on a, on a live basis, and everybody else is choosing to do it online asynchronously, or perhaps even watching a stream, be- and that be- because that ped- that pedagogy was what I would call a relatively weak pedagogy, but very common large lecture hall. You know, lots of information shared, and then you're off doing your homework and then doing doing quizzes and tests. There doesn't you don't need to be in class necessarily as much most students perhaps to to learn as well as if they were there. We still would leave the lecture hall available for students, but we would we had a section, basically a combination of three sections, 1,200 students, and they were they were assigned to a lecture hall of about 180 seats uh, and never had a problem with overcapacity overfilling that. We didn't have them sign up for being an online student or a face-to-face student, um, uh, and yet uh, we knew real quickly after we started this. This was even, you know, at the very beginning of the even even predated uh, Hyflex as a as a term. Uh, yeah. It became pretty clear this is the pattern we were going to get, and so we started just planning for that, and it always worked out. Um, so, uh, just because you only have 15 to 25 percent occupancy. Depending upon you know the the desires of the students, and a lot of that's kind of the nature of the class, uh, the content, you know where they are. You might be able to still give them flexibility if flexibility is is kind of allowed. If you can have students coming in and out, flexibility, all kinds of ways of thinking about flexibility here. Um, uh, this is great. You you did touch on a question about students doing quizzes, and so I want to take this opportunity to bring in a point from Mary Talbot, um, and. Uh, she from Southeast uh, Missouri, and she asks, how do you work to have parity of assessment in the modes? A student participating in a face-to-face class doesn't have anything to show that they are there, but the online student must post to reform. Okay, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, and so, um, uh, and I th- but I, I, think there's, I, think there's, I think there's really two questions there. And the one about parity and assessment is, I think, very important. When I talk about Assessment, usually we're looking at kind of a high level, the summative assessment. How am I going to essentially give you a grade based on the work that you're able to do? Right. And so when we talk about this, especially if you're used to just a face-to-face environment, when you're designing your online course, you have to think carefully about how you're going to do those assessments. To the, to the you know, to the extent that you can do exactly the same activities that lead to accessible, you know, evidence of understanding that I can give a grade on, I mean, a lot of times that if that works well in the classroom, it might work very well online. In the courses I teach, I'm using do, usually doing papers and projects and reports and things like that. And for those, it really doesn't matter how they're presenting them uh, or, or showing them. I mean, everybody's going to do it the same. You're in class, you're putting your paper online, uh, and we're you know we're giving you feedback. You might have peer reviews, et cetera. Same thing for like a project kind of presentation. Where the real difference is for most is when you're doing tests, you know, high stakes testing uh, or quizzes. What I try to get. Uh, faculty to consider if they're not doing them in their LMS already and the kinds of tests that they're trying to do would be supported there. And I think they almost always are uh, to use the LMS for that, no matter which students are, whether they're in class or online. Right. So you can do online testing, even if you want them in a proctored classroom environment. If you're using a proctored classroom environment, then you should probably be doing some sort of a proctored online environment as well, because you want the test conditions to be as much uh, you know, as close as possible to be identical. With that in mind, because there are a lot of other things around a test, right, impact how well students do. And some of it's, hey, is someone watching me? Uh, you know, or do I have a time requirement? Or does it, is it always 8 o'clock in the morning? Or can I do this, you know, at 3 in the afternoon when I kind of feel like I'm better about this? So I also will, will try to say uh, is, well, maybe you can shift everything to an online, more of a kind of an asynchronous test environment so that it's equal. And then maybe shift the character of the test a little bit so that, it acknowledges kind of the new realities. Well, students are probably going to have other resources to draw from if they're not in class and they don't, you know, maybe there's a time requirement. 
Maybe there's not a time requirement. So maybe you can ask a little bit different kinds of questions uh, to get to that without having to be uh, you know, super concerned about, oh my gosh, they might be using their notes or their textbook resources. That's one of the one of the design challenges that a lot of faculty, um, you know, maybe not realize right away, uh, but it's one of the things that they have to think carefully about. If you're shifting from a high stakes testing and quizzing kind of environment, you know, mediated by an LMS, that's easy to evaluate, and you're going to go towards more of like authentic assessment with projects and papers and things like that, um, uh, you know, then uh, there's a lot more work involved involved in giving feedback in those senses. So you have to manage that into the whole workflow question as well. Same thing on the student side. Speaking of which, first of all, we, we had a couple of questions about exams and assessments, and I think you just uh, grabbed all of them. So uh, Georgi and everybody else who, who asked these questions, if, if you have more to follow up, please uh, again follow up. Uh, you also mentioned design, and uh, I wanted to share a question about this from uh, Tom Tobin at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and Tom asked, HyFlex needs intentional design thinking and the concomitant resources and time to implement it. How light can the design phase be over the next two months as we prepare for fall term? Hey, thanks for the question, Tom. Uh, that's a very good question. I mean, I think a lot of us, um, if, if, you're in, if you come from an ex instructional design perspective, you have maybe been trained that way. Uh, you know, there's some of us who are academics in this area, and so we have to. We're instructional designers in a way we think, but we're also faculty members who are in the classroom all the time doing, you know, a lot of uh, rapid prototype and agile kinds of things that we wouldn't normally build into perhaps our formal instructional design process. And so this is sometimes a challenge, uh, especially as I'm working with instructional design staff on campus who want oftentimes want a very prescriptive way of doing this, you know, a very process oriented, and where where a lot of faculty come at it very differently. It's more, much more experiential uh, uh, focused design. Well, I'm going to try this. Doesn't work. I'm going to shift it a little bit and try something else, uh, which is which is often challenging for for those conversations. So what I what I tell uh, my perspective is that we should be designing as if we were going to be teaching a fully asynchronous online course. Uh, we can design for a fully asynchronous online course. We can we can we at least have the tools and the activities and things established that we can use in any of the other modes. There are some different skill sets of facilitating online asynchronous, online synchronous, and in the classroom, right? And so we, you know, those are things that will have are part of the equation as well, especially the engagement of students effectively in those ways. But if we can design, you know, the 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 materials, the activities, the assessment for fully online, then I think we can use those resources across the board. So the question becomes then, would you expect your faculty to be able to design a fully online course over the next two months to teach it in the fall? Right. Okay. So the question is also, well, how much, <laughs> how, how high quality of a course is, is going to be acceptable? What's baseline? When I share uh, the conversation around quality, I'll show the QM rubrics. I'll show the QLT rubrics from Cal State and the, the sure. Oscar rubrics from, uh, from SUNY so that uh, we know kind of where, we, where we'd like to head with this. And yet the conversation is always, well, okay, what's the most important thing? Let's think about content presentation. What are you doing now? Can you do it well online? Boom, done, perhaps. How can you add your voice into this? Can you do some simple introductory videos or that, could that be part of whatever you're providing as far as a, you know, from classroom to online thing? Okay, so how can we build in those ideas of there's teacher presence, right? There's social presence, there's cognitive presence and kind of think through some of those things so that we're doing, we're not doing perhaps a QM certifiable online course, yet we are doing something that is good enough to get started, good enough to get students achieving those uh, learning outcomes with a plan for bringing in other components, um, you know, as we develop the capability to do so. Since most of most of the faculty are also faculty designers, they often end up building their own courses. I think it's important to start with a, an achievable baseline expectation and then encouraging them to go a step beyond, a step beyond, a step beyond. And this is where instructional design staff, I think, can be critical. Uh, it, you know, some campuses may build online courses for faculty already. You know, that's a different arrangement that we have on our campus. Uh, but in that situation, okay, can the instructional design staff turn that on? Uh, uh, if, the, but if the faculty are doing it, well, what do you need just to get started? On our campus, we created a uh, kind of a jumpstart to online teaching a couple of years ago in response to a localized emergency where we were going to, we were thought we might lose our campus uh, ability to access the campus. And so we said, well, what, what are the most important things? You know, there's probably six, six or seven real important things, content, right, assessment, and engagement. 
and you get get a starting point in every of those areas. What are you know what's one or two things? I also tell um, um, I also include in the conversation uh, the, the importance to use the things you have already available, like in your learning management system that's supported by your staff on campus. It's already been vetted. It's already been approved. Your students don't have to struggle to try to get into a new thing. Yeah. Some online teachers use a lot of different tools and they use them very well. But a lot of times they're taking on all the responsibility for the IT support, uh, you know, the risk around security and privacy, all those kinds of things. And, and when we're getting started, it's like stay in, you know, kind of stay on the reservation here in, in the sense of use the discussion boards in the LMS. If you're going to do discussions, use the other tools you have available there, share the resources the way uh, that are that are similar to what you're doing now, kind of, you know, you know, ease into this in some way, even though it might be kind of a jolt that started. That's a really, really rich answer. Thank you. Um, I, I, I can see why your students um, uh, really benefit from you um, because you're enormously informative. Uh, we have a question from a, a near colleague of mine uh, at Georgetown, John Stites, who asks an um, institutional question. Is there any minimum institutional co contribution or function that is required for HiveLax? All right, that's a good question. You could kind of take that lots of different ways. I think uh, what I'm seeing, let's, let me let me let me answer that a couple of different from a different couple of different perspectives. One of the round is the faculty development side of it. What we're seeing this summer, a lot of institutions providing faculty development workshops around online teaching or perhaps high flex teaching or any other name uh, for that kind of approach, uh, which are often uh, you know some sort of stipended, so they provide some some. Uh, some recognition of the effort faculty are putting into, even though they never come close to actually paying faculty for the time they're investing in in teaching differently. Mm. To the extent the institution's done a good job of uh, communicating and finding agreement with the faculty as a lar as a large body of the importance of doing things differently, that seems to go a lot better. Where there's a lot of disconnect between administration and faculty, and administration is making decisions saying we shall do this in the fall without having that, you know, that conversation with the faculty. Uh, especially faculty governance uh, around what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. Oftentimes that becomes then something that it's just, it just becomes a, you know, how can you make us do this? We can't do this. You know, so it doesn't work very well. So faculty support in that direction. The other, uh, the institutions has to be able to support the pedagogies in the classroom. And so if there's no way to, if, you know, adequately capture audio and video from a classroom, you know, then it's possible that you would not try to do synchronous live connections in the, in the classroom and just focus more on the asynchronous online environment, right? Uh, because if you can't do the audio well in a classroom, uh, that's going to that's going to that's going to make that a very poor experience for the students trying to connect synchronously. And if you're relying on a recording of that as part of your asynchronous materials, that's going to not work well either. So I think that's a, that's an important thing to do. You might find that in in on on your campus that some you have some rooms ready to go for this. Other ones, uh, you know, might need some substantial enhancement. Some maybe not so much in substantial enhancement. Uh, we talked a little bit about. Well, we mentioned flexspace.org before. I think they're they're starting to capture some designs, mm -hmm. especially for fall in response. And some of those are high flex course to, um, uh, kind of designed rooms as well. So that's another good resource to look for those kinds of. So that kind of that kind of support. A third part about this is clearly around uh, communicating to students. The institution has to have a common message to students so they know uh, what what the options are you know this is not a surprise um but especially if you're going to roll out a new a new format for them that some of their courses might be in or or maybe just being available for them what does that mean uh and so that idea of consistent communication to students and other stakeholders right the parent communities uh, maybe funding organizations or other kinds of things so that's another important thing that the institution i think has an important uh role to play in now in, in normal times uh probably in this time too, how do students register for a course like this? You know, there's a potential that if they take a high flex course uh, and yeah. they intend to do it as an online student, they could potentially, they could take another class that's offered at exactly the same time if they intended to do that in face-to-face -in -face and that was intention or uh, available for them. So if that's the kind of flexibility that would be provided at least uh, to meet the strategic goals for doing this, then that would have to be something that's supported by you know, your registration system, um, uh, either registrar and all those other things. Some campuses have differential fees for online on, online sections compared to face to face sections. How are you going to manage that? If it's an on, if a high flex course, will you charge them online fees? Will you charge them face to face fees? Will will that help 
will that be part of your decision about whether you're not you let them make, make choices? Hey, you're gonna sign up to this as an online student. You can be part of it, but you're gonna pay the online fee and you're not allowed to be in the classroom or something like that. Uh, so it can get kind of, uh, kind of complicated, which is why it's important to have strategic conversations, you know, at multiple levels with all your constituents on campus, administrators and faculty and support staff and other kinds of support staff who might be dealing with students in a new way, you know, tutoring online, advising online, library support online. If you're not doing that already, um, then you've got some real challenges to overcome before you can really do this well. This is all the, the minimum. What a fantastic question. And uh, that answer you can take to each of your campuses right now as just the baseline uh, before we go further. Um, we have, um, let's see. Oh, still can't get the camera. Wait, we have the camera working. Uh, at a conceptual level, uh, Tom Hames from uh, the <laughs> Texas area has a, a really, really great question, a uh, challenging one. Tom? So um, my question is this, um, at, you know, a lot of the early response, a number of early responses to the crisis that we're facing right now had to do with making some systemic adjustments, such as I remember there were some suggestions of, of institutions pushing the spring semester into the summer to give people more time to prepare. Uh, uh, someone suggested on one of Brian's programs months ago that you know schools should be thinking about very short semesters so that if something is disruptive, uh, you're not losing large chunks of, of the semester time to shut downs and things like that. Um, one of the things I've kind of noticed in looking through HyFlex is that it's very much in alignment with, you know, traditional institutional constraints of sem uh, sections, semesters, you know, X, X week semesters and things like that. It doesn't really challenge or disrupt those things. And as I've been working my way through some of these questions, I keep running up against systemic constraints that I think are going to be a real problem if the unexpected and at this point, I'm expecting the unexpected uh, occurs in the fall and institutions are forced to, as Brian put it in one of his uh, excellent blog posts a number of months ago, do what's called the toggle term, you know, where you unexpectedly are turning on and turning off the in-person switch. Um, my question to you about HyFlex is, you know, when you originally developed it, did you, you know, when you were thinking this through, you know, did you make compromises because of these kind of systemic constraints? And are those still appropriate going forward in the fall where some of these constraints might be under significant challenge? Yeah, well, I would say uh, definitely, uh, as I was designing this in, in my world, which is very traditional higher education here, public, large public institution in the US, um, yeah, those constraints were, were naturally part of what the way we designed to fit. Uh, what I was, what I'm trying to do, and had been trying to do, was not to create something that's uh, totally outside the system and kind of standing on its own. And yet, you know, you could make good arguments about lots of aspects of the way we do education in general, but higher education in particular in the in the states that could, you know, might be a lot better outside of a different system. But yet, we're we're all kind of growing up from within the system. So that's kind of a right. that's a different different conversation. But really, but I think what you what what one of the things that, I mean, even the little thing about giving students control over whether they're in the classroom or not, or doing it online, for a lot of places, that's a radical concept, right? We have had instructor and, and uh, institutional control over students' participation you know, for probably as long as we've had kind of formal institutions like ours who are doing this. And so that itself, I think, is a big reason why, you know, we had 10,000 you know, faculty using HyFlex over the years, we've, you know, there's been hundreds in lots of different places. Uh, but I think that's part of the things that has, has led to kind of slow growth because we always had the luxury of making those choices. And so now if we're looking for ways that support this, I think we'll see a lot of people who are using blended approaches like this or co-modal approaches, if you will, uh, yeah. that don't give students flexibility in part because they don't want to give students flexibility. They might not be able to, that's probably likely for fall, but I think afterwards, you still might find people who are gonna be offering programs that don't have as much flexibility as I would like to see them give students because of the, the control aspect. I mean, that's a that's a philosophical perspective that I think is still gonna be difficult for many to, to think about uh, think about doing. Uh, yeah, those are certainly part of the constraints. So we will, we, we're, we're gonna be, have to, we have to work within our systems now, um, you know, even in the fall. The problem is, the, the good thing about HyFlex is you have the opportunity to be, you know, kind of agile in your response to situations. The spring, 
uh, you know, we, I was asking my students, hey, are you going to be in class this week? Uh, this is like early March. I said, if you're not going to be in class, we won't have a class meeting. And before I could get the responses, the university sent the email saying, hey, in class, in class cl every, all classes are canceled for a week. We'll be an online university starting in, you know, in a week from now. And so for, my, for me, no problem. I just, you know, said, well, I'll just use, we'll just use the online materials and we'll just run the course online. Um, we were already prepared for that. It was more of a disruption, I think, for my students. So because even though the class was available for them online, half of them were always coming to class. And so they weren't in the mindset of being an online student. And so they had to kind of readjust their perspectives on how they're going to learn in the class. Uh, but we were able to kind of toggle into the fully online world. And if we had the opportunity to come back to class on campus, I would have asked my students if they intended to come to class. And if so, then then uh, we probably would have restarted our in class. But we could go on and off you know, that way because we could be prepared for all the contingencies. And that's one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is instructional continuity. I mean, we've all been dealing with that. Uh, my experience has been on campuses that do business continuity planning. That really, it's really focused on the business side of running the university. And I think less so on some campuses on the instructional continuity, getting academic mm -hmm. affairs leadership exactly. and faculty to think about that in kind of a business perspective. Okay, if we can't be here on campus, how do we keep doing business? Um, right. So those are those are those are also questions. I mean, I've been asked that over time. When I was an administrator, the president or the provost would ask, "Okay, whenever we had a looming regional conflict, you know, transit strike or or fires or things like that, they said, well, can we just teach all our classes online?'" And I oversaw the acad academic technology group. Uh, technology group. I said, "Well, technically, we could. We have the infra infrastructure to support that. The question is whether the faculty will be able and willing to teach fully online, since 95% of them." Uh, teach all in the classroom and may have never taught an online course. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, one one of the things I've been looking at in terms of, you know, my own responses as well as trying to help other people out is literally deconstructing what we're doing in the classroom, you know, from the perspective of this works better in an asynchronous mode anyway, so just do it that way. And what parts do we need to have this face-to-face -face communication or where are those the best, right? And then taking those chunks and saying, okay, how do we, you know, structure the time of the class so that those are still there. So this semester, most of my classes is asynchronous, it's online, mm -hmm. but I have twice weekly meetings with my students, once broken down by groups and once as a review session, where I'm just catching up and I'm, you mm -hmm. know, helping them with their projects and all this sort of stuff. Technically that's hybrid. I mean, it's still got that synchronous element and I record those things so that if you want to watch them after the fact, mm -hmm. you can. But I've been very deliberate in deciding these things work where I need to be having a two-way conversation. These mm -hmm. things work the best here. And these other things, you know, if I'm just giving them content, I'll record it and put it online. They can watch that anytime. I don't have to have an audience for that. I mean, Socratic doesn't work if you're not there anyway, right? So anyway. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so that's that's the thing is that I'm I, I'm concerned that the we're, we're not going to be as nimble as we need to be. So, but thanks for the answer. Great. Mm -hmm. Tom, thank you so much for the great question, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, for uh, all of your uh, all of your questions and comments throughout. Um, I think we have time for one last question because we're right at the end of our of our time, um, and this is uh, one that comes from uh, our uh, wonderful friends at uh, Ithaca SNR in New York, um, and this is a question about to kind of bound our our issue here, um, which is when wouldn't we use uh, high flex. When would it not work out well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And this is always something I, I try to include as part of my talks as well, especially for those who are thinking about maybe doing this. Uh, and most of that was clearly pre-COVID. Uh, but I would also, I would always say, you know, if you have no good reason to try to combine online students and face-to-face -face students in the same course sections, if there's no strategic need, you know, uh, even a perce strong perceived need. Uh, from a major stakeholder that you know group could be faculty it could be institution it could be students etc then i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend this right it's it's it is more difficult to get started and it takes a change in what you how the the work you're doing and anytime you're asking people to change there ought to be a very good reason why so if you don't have a good compelling why i would say stick with a single mode and pick whichever mode and if you have you know one of the reasons we did this is because we didn't have the wealth to offer both modes at the same time we had we had money for one section and we wanted to create we wanted to be able to serve both students and so for us it started as really kind of a almost like a, a, a financial need in some ways and some campuses still make that decision based on financial considerations um, so uh, that's what I'd say if it doesn't fit there now 
the other thing I'll say is, well, once again, some courses are not natural fit to the online environment. If a course can't be taught well online, then it, it can't probably be taught well in a, in a pure high flex format. Some sort of hybrid might work best. I'm thinking classes with lots of lab equipment uh, or, or you know, dangerous situations where you really need that face-to-face in-person kind of thing to get uh, the learning inco- outcomes met. But if you can meet the learning outcomes, the agreed upon learning outcomes for the course, for the session, you know, for the topic, whatever you're trying to teach them uh, online, then then a high flex could be possible if you have a compelling need to, to make it work. But, you know, got to start with a why, like a lot of us have heard before. And, you know, it's very true. Oh, that is very true. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine, for the excellent, excellent question, of course. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for the uh, superb answer. Uh, we have, um, we're right at the edge of our session, and we have covered a huge, huge amount of ground, which is just uh, uh, staggering. Um, and I wanted to uh, bring up one more person, uh, if we can. Uh, let me see if we have the, uh, um, if we can bring this up. Hi. There we go. Welcome. This is Steve Gottlieb, the founder and CEO of Shindig. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, amazing uh, talk to you, Brian, as well. Um, Thank you. So um, I wanted to pick up uh, on a couple of themes and also as a question. I'm curious, when you do online instruction, which is your technology of, of uh, preferred technology to use? Well, when asynchronously, we use a Moodle learning management system on our campus and so most of the IE synchronous things I do are within that uh, and then when we're doing live online instruction we're use a zoom platform right. uh, and, and we do that because it's provided by the university and really I think our system so uh, so um, I just wanted to mention as part of uh, uh, kind of a, in response to what you said about contingency to the extent high flex mm-hmm. wasn't even a possibility and to the comments that you made and I'm curious how you re- reflect on that. Uh, uh, we built Shindig in part to uh, uh, enable all the deep interactivity that a class provides from students having all the peer-to-peer interactivity to self-assemble and confer with one another and collaborate, all that peer-to-peer education uh, that's so valuable in the classroom could occur. And likewise, all the different dynamics that a teacher would want from cold calling to throwing open a podium to uh, circulating around a class and, and, and meeting with teams, that all those were enabled. And um, um, so I was struck by some of what you said, suggesting that online was inherently less than physical. Um, and whether you ever see a day that with technology like Shindig, uh whether in fact online could be truly competitive uh with physical and wouldn't have to be looked at as as somewhat lesser i know it is now but i I like to think where we're going is is that with things like this that the real value of tech for education namely to gut the cost of residential campus life and make it accessible at scale at at a lower cost and compensate educators better and give better ba- value to students by getting rid of uh, uh, the need for a lot of the physical plant, um, that that's uh, still a promise that we should all be leaning into. Well, I'm, I'm sorry if that's what you interpreted my saying. I, I, don't, I didn't intend to say that the online um, environment is in any way less than the face-to-face environment inherently. There is highly effective online in, uh, instruction going on and has been for many, many years asynchronously as well as synchronously, less so, less less timeline synchronously, but there's some really good online instruction going on in the synchronous world, and I don't think it necessarily is less. I do think it's very different um, uh, in in each of these different care. Uh, we have you know different characteristics of the technology provide for different kinds of interactions, right? And so, to the extent we can leverage those well, take advantage of the you know the resources that we have available, like in the synchronous environment. Same thing asynchronously. You have different different affordances there. The way those systems are designed. You can still have highly effective online or instruction in, in those ways. So I don't mean to say that. What I think it's doing is really giving us another way to reach students and support their learning. And my perspective is I want to try to give students as much choice as possible uh, and give them actually some ways to build competencies in these ways. Because uh, you know sometimes 
you know, the in-person for me as a student in this content is better for me than the synchronous online or the asynchronous online. Sometimes the other formats are, are, more, are better for me. And sometimes it's because I can't get to the other formats. And so this is the only one I have. And so by default, it's kind of the best choice. So I think that uh, in general, you know, I think we're going to see a, a, a kind of the world we're going to is one where we have more and more options rather than one particular option kind of taking over the taking over the educational space. You know, every time we have a relatively new technology come out, we hear a lot about it. And then the good ones find a place to play. Uh, but the uh, old ones that still worked don't go away. Look at all the books behind Brian there. You know, the, that, that book technology not going away. I see your stack of books behind you as well. Not going away. Right. Although we can do online resources, ebooks, et cetera, and it can be richer and the whole works. You know, I think that, I think we have similar kinds of situations going on uh, in that in that aspect. Uh, Brian, uh, Steve, hold on just a second. So I want to I want to come back to you. Uh, we we have we're at past the end of the hour, so I, I have to wrap things up. Uh, but Brian, I, I wanted to first say uh, thank you so much for for being a fantastic guest. Uh, I mean, you you seem to be the expert for the fall twenty twenty. Um, education and technology world. I mean, it's just a tremendous, tremendous position for you to be in. Thank you for making all this time for us. Um, the question I had was, how can we keep up with you? What's the, literally, what's the, uh, what's the best way to track you, uh, through Twitter or through something else? Well, right now I'm, I'm trying to rely on things that don't require my immediate one-to-one -to -one interaction as much as possible. So the resources we have are on the book and I, I freely send out lots of other kind of design materials that I'm using in workshops and things like that. So initial contact by phone or not phone, email. No, why did I say phone? Uh, <laughs> email. Uh, and then we usually set up often. I do a lot of Zoom calls with people, too. Uh, so that's probably the best way, because uh, there are a lot of people doing this work. There are a lot of people you know, who could answer questions similar to the way I have. I probably have the most experience, at least talking about HyFlex uh, to groups. And so I think I get a lot of calls that way. But on your own campuses and in your own systems, you may have people who are also teaching effectively this way or supporting it. So uh, there, I think I think the, the expertise is distributed, right? So um, well, we'll that's why I think I don't need to be the 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 focal, the focal point of, of of that necessarily. Well, you are a fantastic point, and uh, today we have hundreds of people. I Brian, I'd love to bring you back, um, um, maybe this fall to uh, sure, to yeah. Up. See how how things are how things are now, right? Yeah, we'd really really like that. So thank you, thank you again um, so much. Um, now um, and we'll come back. Um, so let me just uh, let me just say that uh, we have uh, a couple of pointers for the next few weeks. I wanted to mention uh, one is that we have um, our uh, next few sessions will include, as you can see, um, the uh, point about uh, uh, we have uh, fall 2020 planning um, in great detail. Next week we have uh, experts on demographics. Uh, we'll have another one talking about improving teaching, another at public universities, another about how to do live events well, which is obviously something that we're all really concerned about and interested in. Um, but we also uh, uh, keep talking about this. We have our conversations proceeding on social media, especially Twitter. So if you'd like to keep this conversation going, and Twitter's already been on fire for the past hour, just use FTTE. Um, and uh, if you'd like to go back to our previous recordings, uh, just go to tinyworld.com slash FTF archive. We have 210 recordings. And that's where the recording for today will be. Um, and Steve, did you want to add anything about uh, uh, about Shindig uh, before we go? Yes, I, I, I just wanted to uh, add that I think Shindig can, uh, um, if anyone is interested in using Shindig for their own institution uh, or recommending it to its institution, not just for its uh, uh, classroom applications, where I think we offer more peer-to-peer -peer learning and more interactivity, but also for these critical kind of large-scale participatory town halls, whether it's freshman orientation or faculty meetings or meetings for overseas students or social events, uh, all the campus-wide events uh, that really depend on uh, people be, being able to self-aggregate into small conversation groupings and or take the stage and address a large audience, whether it's the dean uh, giving an address or student groups. We're going to offer to anyone who is a future trans forum uh, uh, attendee uh, an additional 10% discount uh, on, uh, on Shindig, which is already at a 50% discount for 
uh, all educational institutions during COVID. Um, so uh, if anyone wants to take us up on that, just mention that you're a Future Trends uh, Forum attendee uh, and uh, write to me, steve at shindig.com. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you again for providing this technology that makes the forum work. Um, I have to wrap things up. I have to say uh, goodbye to everybody. Thank you all for being uh, participants in a fantastic conversation, uh, really diving into the main, main ways we can think about teaching and learning this fall. Uh, again, thank you all. Please stay in touch, stay safe, and we'll see you online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>